I am in the office in Buffalo of Chuck Mancuso. And I'm glad to be here at Buffalo State College. And um, I'm going to describe you as a, well, first of all, professor of music, and but a uh, researcher and author and a huge fan. Is that where it started, as being a huge fan of this yeah, music? Right. Started uh, back in the uh, 50s. And I was just a kid playing a lot of sports. And, and I thought I was going to be a sports writer. And I found out that this great music that I loved, you know, my father had these 78s. And uh, when we were little kids, both mom and dad worked. And so they'd say, on Saturday mornings, you've got to be quiet because we're upstairs sleeping oh. in the house. Yeah. So I go and went through his records. I mean, I was like maybe nine, ten years old, and uh, the first things that hit me were those boogie-woogie things of Pete Johnson. I, you know, I go, oh my God, this is so cool. And Albert Ammons and the rest mm -hmm. of them. And he was a big Frankie Carl fan. Frankie uh, Carl? Yeah. He was Cocktail? Like, right. Yeah. He was very f florid and fluid and yeah. you know, romantic, and my father was, he wasn't a musician. My mother wasn't a musician. No one had any instruments in the house. but. I got stung, and uh, as the years went on, I started reading every book I could. Um, you know, one summer I'd just read Hemingway, Storm Jameson, Jameson, and a number of others had nothing to do with music, and uh, another summer was all the Beat Generation, but other summers it was just music, just all the things I could get on jazz and pop and everything else. And I always wondered why they never taught this stuff in school because it was so fascinating. I had no one to talk to. There was no one to share it with. I was going to say you couldn't have had many uh, uh, friends that were boys that were your age that no. would like. So, what do you think of James P. Johnson? <laughs> yeah, right. Is he a pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies? Yeah. I, mean, I knew every baseball player, so I was pretty good there. And, and uh, you know, I was a basketball kid. And, uh, but I had this other passion. And um, so on weekends, uh, I'd go to the Grosvenor Library, the downtown library, and they would have these magazines down in the sub-basement, and I would get them called up, and they'd get to know who I was. So as soon as I walk in, I go, I want the jazz reviews, you know, of all the ones I didn't read last week, and I'd take notes on them. And then I'd, the old metronomes. And in those days, Esquire wrote about jazz, too. They sure did. They're beautiful. Yeah. And one of the librarians, my girlfriend's a librarian at uh, Buffalo State uh, Butler Library, they were cleaning things out, and she found a number of the old Esquires from 1942, 43, 44. She says, this is for Chuck. Oh, my God. So, you know, anything I could find, I would, I would just collect. And um, Plus, they sponsored that, uh, that photo that became... Great Day in Harlem. Oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah. Esquire magazine did. Yes, and that's after they kind of gave up a little bit on jazz, mm -hmm. but there had to be something there, you know, that kept them with it. So here I was in school, and I, we were a nomadic tribe. We went, moved. It was like the, you know, the Italians, we, and we weren't alone with Italians, but my father's family, there was Sicilian, and uh, the Mancusos, and the, his father, you know, they had f four kids, three boys and a, a girl, and they bought a house, you know, they're from Sicily, and, uh, and they made sure that there was room for the sons, okay, and as the sons got married, there was a place. My mother's people were from the middle of uh, Italy, and he was a hard-working guy, you know, and he used to say, Medi. You do not date those Sicilian boys. Do they not like to get their fingers dirty, their fingernails dirty? And they, it's true, they were slickers. I see. The Italians were slickers. Uh, 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 Sicilians. 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 You know, a lot of stones, you know, everybody dominated them. That's where the mob kind of stuff came from. Uh, and my, all of those guys went into sales. They were, <laughs> they were slick guys, you know. My Uncle Bay, he, he was, you know, all these uh, Baker and Cresberries and Martin Brandy, and then you get a head buyer at uh, uh, Sattler's, and he used to call me up, Neff. I just got back from 
a slack bar. And uh, I, I got a great tiger tooth, two button, and it gets you a nice pair of black crease, you know, with our tailor. Come on down, we'll take care of it. I always had, you know, I just put them a little money down. I always did a little extra work. And my Uncle Blaze, who I was with last night, uh, he worked at AMA's. These guys were all clothiers. And he goes, Chucky, you gotta understand, Uncle Blaze. You, know, you gotta understand, it doesn't matter about the first suit you sell. Anybody can sell the suit. You treat them nice to come back again. It's what he talked. I'm telling you, this guy. It was unbelievable. That's great. So I knew how to dress, man. I, yeah. I dressed okay. all the time. You were sharp. I was sharp, yeah, because of that. Yep. And I thought, and he'd say to me, <laughs> Uncle Bay was pretty slick. He'd go, you ain't no Cary Grant, but you sure will be able to dress well. All right. <laughs> was there an Italian musical tradition in, in your family in the circle? No. Really? No, I know. This is the, the, my mother, Mary, very big on race. Oh my God. You didn't, you didn't screw out blacks. So when I was in nursery school, uh, uh, she would take me to nursery school and the very next year my brother in nursery school, we're in a little housing thing. Uh, my father was off uh, World War II and it was me and uh, this little other guy who was black and and my mother held my hand and his hand and then two days a week um, um, the, the the lady right now I'm trying to remember the names so we were so close would would hold my hand and his hand and take us to, and we got to be great friends throughout our lives the kid and I yeah and he was that, a boy there was a, he, a boy he was a boy kid. also yeah, yeah, we were both the same age. Mm -hmm. I mean, she would just go crazy. If any, you know, the Italians, would, you know, the Italians and the Irish had this little separation of and antagonism. You know, we kind of hated each other <laughs> historically. If you read this recent book about 400 years of uh, uh, a new book that just came out on um, Greenwich Village, and you know, I saw that. that's a great book. And it talks about the animosity. There was always that kind of asthma. And there was something about some of my people that was tough about the blacks. You know, uh, they used to call them Mulan Johns. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know that was um, eggplant because it was a shiny black. Wow, plant. how do you spell that? Mulan John, M U L. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But my mother. Oh my God, when, when she heard Grandpa Mancuso, a Sicilian tough guy, I didn't know he had some light mob connections. He dealt the cards for the big games okay. on Connecticut Street. She would rail at him. She says, we don't treat people like that, you know, uh, about, a, about blacks. If he ever said Moulin John, oh, man. So I came but up she didn't. Lucky. But she didn't want you to associate with black people. Of course she did. Oh, she did? She's the one that walked... I'm, I'm sorry, I the misunderstood. Black kid. Yeah, I'm misunderstood. talking fast right now. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I see. Buddy Clark, uh, little, little Buddy Clark and Mrs. Clark. Some days Mrs. Clark would take myself and Buddy. Okay. And the other days, and my mother, um, you know, I have a, a, an award in her name. She was the yeah. first uh, female manager in New York State of the uh, unemployment agency and employment agency, mm -hmm. both, in 1947 as a woman and as an Italian woman. She's a bright woman. So she was my model on, on how to deal with that stuff. And you had <coughs> these boogie woogie records in your house. Right. Were you aware that that most of those players were black? Oh yeah, because uh, a couple had... of those albums, none of those 78 albums yeah. covers had the pictures. Okay. You know? Sometimes they had drawings, you know, like Fats Wall with yeah. the big lips and everything. But. <laughs> But I love those guys, and as I read about jazz, you know, most of these guys were black, and, the, and the, especially the foreign writers, they were really very sympathetic to yes. that, that world. And the very few of these guys who were writing, uh, who were American, were, were the prejudiced ones, you know, the early ones. Mm -hmm. So I came up reading about these guys, and then in high school, you know, it was the the beat generation and I go why isn't stuff taught in school man I love this stuff and nothing nothing, nothing. occasionally I'd find a friend who was usually in theater or something 
And then I came to Buffalo State, and I made all high in basketball, so I, I was kind of coveted by a number of schools. I went to Buff State, and, um, and by the third year, I dropped out, I came back, and um, I started writing for the newspaper. And this one guy, Jack Lyons, had been the editor, and he said, you know, why don't you become the sports editor? You're always saying, how come there's no pictures? I was doing photography a lot in those days. And I said, yeah, you know, there's no pictures. Don't you have somebody to take pictures? Well, you know, one guy, and, and I said, well, I, I'll get pictures. I, I do darkroom work. So I started getting all these pictures, and I was a sports editor for th two and a half years. And then Jack Lyons, same guy, he was a clever guy. He, his article was the Lyons, L-Y-O-N, possibly den, the Lyons den, Jack Lyons. So he said, you got to write a little history on jazz because you know everything about jazz. I didn't know anything about jazz, so I, I, but I read all this stuff, so I knew more than anybody else. So I wrote this part one, part two history, and my first article came out. And uh, so I got the paper, I want to see how it lined up and everything. And it didn't just say Chuck Mancuso, it said Chaz with Jazz. I go, son of a gun. I go, Lion's Den, Chaz with Jazz. You have a way, Jack, you know. <laughs> And that's what I was. I was yeah, jazz so with jazz. jazz. And in the spring of 64, I just started the second semester of the 63 year, um, I took this course in Bill Talmadge. It was, it, the course was called Afro-American Music. And uh, it was upstairs in this building. And when he played a test, he had to put a little blockade because you couldn't see the records because they didn't have tapes in those days. I mean, you know, consumable. <laughs> sure, sure. And I, I know if it was Riverside. I know if it was Blue Note. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, he, he loved me. And uh, I had a lot to learn about gospel and folk and everything. But he, he said, you know, you, you have some good writing skills. I said, yeah, I'm a bad speller. But I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on the spelling. And uh, so he had me. I couldn't get up in front of people to speak. And in, in those days, I was very, you know. I could play in front of thousands of people. You know, that picture there, we used to, we used to jam the gym. I was a captain uh, for two and a half years of the basketball team and all conference and NAI All-American my senior year. Nice. So I had a real nice career. And uh, and he loved it to go to my basketball games. You know, on the court, you're about as tall as most of the guys, but you play like you're 6'5". I, oh. I love you, Professor Talman. Oh, you're so right. nice. But he had me teach for one week on the contemporary movement. This is 1964, so something on um, Blue Note Records. So I did a thing with Blue Note and Riverside Records, on, you know, Art Blakey and, and, and Horace Silver and that stuff. And it was cool. So the girl was in the class and she sat next to me. She said, you know, my cousin just signed a record contract with the Riverside Records. You were talking about Riverside. And uh, he's real big, and you know, it's Chuck Mangione. And uh, oh, he says, The Jazz Brothers? The Jazz Brothers, yeah, yeah the first album. And, you know, the Dizzy Gillespie upswept trumper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you went through Rochester, That's you I'm got from. known. Yeah, so you know right. that those guys would go for Sunday. <laughs> they yeah. say, You've got to make a stop at Rochester. The Mangione family will take good care of you. So she said, You know, I, I said, Well, let me know something about him. Bring me a scrapbook and everything. I said, uh, the first concert I ever did was the Mangione Brothers, 1960, it was probably 65, or maybe late 64. I don't have any posters of it, but that was the first one I did. And that was the beginning of me putting on concerts, and eventually doing things where I would uh, do little workshops with each of the artists. That was the key. It had to be educational. Let me ask you about a few things um, in your book, Popular Music. Um, and the underground. And the underground. Because um, you've said some really interesting things. One thing I liked that you said, uh, you know, a lot of people like the phrase, jazz is America's only original art form. Yeah. And I used to, I think when I read that when I was younger, I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, we cool. believed it at first. That's great. Yeah. It sounds really good. <laughs> I know. And then you start thinking, now wait a minute, where did where did blues come from? And where did rock and roll come from? And where did bluegrass come where from? Where did bluegrass come yeah. from? So was, that's you know, I was jazz with jazz, you know, that's what I believe too. But you know, through Talmadge, Bill was this amazing, gentle, tall, bland looking <laughs> Nebraskan guy, you know. And, but he, he had been on the road with uh, uh, um, the bubble guy, you know. Kate Kaiser? No, no. Oh, Lawrence Welk. Lawrence Welk. When, and Lawrence Welk, that's when he had a little bit of a jazz group. And, and, and Bill played some jazzy nice. stuff with him, you know. I don't think he recorded. But um, so he, when he did his studies, you know, he really started with, with hymnody, white hymnody, and... Um, uh, shape note singing mm -hmm. and spirituals and gospel of blacks and uh, and then he was big on folk music you know the folk collection the song catchers and all that so this is a side I didn't know about so he would take me to Springville I mean I'm a West Side kid you know <laughs> we go to Springville and we go looking for these records and and we go to these holiness churches and he'd take me into black churches and white churches. And, and he'd take me into black church. Now, everybody's black. And here comes this pale, yeah. tall man. And I, you know, I had some trepidation, you know, but he, he, I guess he knows some of these people. And they open the door, and we go walking in, and they're hollering oh, tambourines and everything. Oh, Professor Talmadge is here. It was a white man who teaches at the university center who thinks what we do is significant. Was well, that something? And they froze, you know, they go, oh, Professor Talmadge, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, you know. He didn't talk real loud or anything. And he said, would you play something for us? And he'd sit down and he'd play a gospel tune and they, they just went crazy because this white guy who looked so square <laughs> could do this stuff. And I was astounded because you know, I really couldn't play or anything. And so. I eventually took some piano lessons. Could, could you join in from a, even just a hand, clapping your hands? Oh, sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And did you feel compelled to do so because of the music? I mean... No, I not, not, to, not to show them that I could do, you know, okay. offbeat stuff. that's my question. No, I, I was very, so respectful, you know. I thought I'd stay out of the way because he was the show. I was just a sidekick. They didn't know who I was, and they didn't really care. They figured I probably was his son. So I was an adjunct to him. He was the one. You know, we went into some of the white churches. The same kind of thing happened. And uh, uh, and so I learned all this stuff because of Bill. And he'd give me his notes. You know, he'd show me how to do it. I'd go visit him all the time. I remember telling him one time Coltrane was in town, and, you know, and I called him up. I said, oh, McCoy Tyner just took a 21 in it. 21 minutes, so I used to time everything, you know. And he goes, I, uh, I can't do it right now, Chuck, because I'm teaching uh, country and folk, and my whole head is country and folk. I didn't understand at the time, but he did his intro courses, which were the big draws, like my jazz rock, now American popular music, is a big draw. And then he did the special course, you know, which was they didn't have writing intensive, but it was you had to write essays and stuff. So when he was in that, you know, he stayed in there. And then when he was doing the modern jazz, and he'd come see Coltrane with me and Miles and all these guys. And so he was an amazing man. And the fact that he would constantly call me son. And when I replaced him, when I came back because uh, 1970 into 71, Rockefeller left. left governorship and all of a sudden all that money. I mean we had people that went from instructor to full professor in like three years and you got stuck with these people. He was almost too good with the money for education. That's how strongly he believed in education. So uh, they had to let me go in 1971 because they didn't have the money. I was the last hired first let go. But I kept teaching summer courses and a night course, and what we now call an adjunct while I was at Baker Hall. Right. So when he retired, I did my interviews. They didn't want me because uh, as, as much as I, as great as I did, uh, 
we had P Peter Yates who wrote this book on American music, uh, a very important book in American music. There's a lot of classical music, Peter okay. Yates. And his wife was a world's interpreter of Charles Ives. They were very important out in California. And our department hated this guy because he didn't play music. He was a literature uh, writer about music. His, his wife played music. He's a great writer, though. But he appreciated me, you know. But they had to let me go. So now I come back from my interviews. And they're pelting me with these questions because they didn't want me, most of them. No, they all liked me because I didn't spit at anybody. I wasn't, you know, a horrible guy. Uh, but I wasn't one of them. And, uh, and Talmadge said, there's no one in America can do what he's doing right now. Are you kidding? He's, he's way beyond all the other guys. They have bigger names. He works at this. Fifteen hours a day he had to give me some time to play basketball <laughs> six nights a week, you know. But I really did work hard at it. And it looked good that I was going to get the job. And Mary Fiore always came at me. He says, what would you do if you had to teach theory? And she didn't say, what would you do, Chuck, if you had to teach theory? She had this nasty way about her. And I says, well, Mary, I wouldn't be able to do that because I'm not trained for it. But let me say to all of you, if you had to teach urban blues and rock, I can assure you, uh, if you're not up on what Led Zeppelin had been doing or some of these other groups, it's not like teaching about Mozart in the old days where you can get away with making a mistake. They will know. You will be found. And that's dangerous. And you have to know what you're talking about. And I can do that pretty well. This art thing, what has to happen for an American popular music style to get to the level of being considered an art form. I mean, jazz did. Yeah. Um, is blues an art form, and why so? Well, I don't know what the parameters of how you define uh, an art form, but uh, I think when when more and more historians slash critics start doing real heavy research and they see there are connections to, to many other areas not necessarily Matisse and the French you know impressionist movement because these were mostly uneducated guys and gals doing blues but the fact that the records were important you know today they call it roots music you know I was calling it underground music but it's all underground you know building up so I think uh, when the when the historians and the cultural critics start picking up the the momentum of something that they didn't even know about a lot of them or someone like Charlie Kyle when Charlie Kyle did his book on urban blues and you had these other Samuel Charters and the rest of these guys who who really elevated you know Mississippi John Hurt and all those older guys um, and then those historians put down the city guys because they were unkinking their hair, they were ironing their hair, they were wearing shiny suits and they were playing and they were plugging those goddamn instruments in, you know, and they're making a lot of noise and they were putting that stuff down, yeah. you know. And what Kyle said, he was a sociologist in Chicago at the time, anthropology, sociology, and uh, his book, Urban Blues, was, was, was the, the key. He said, those older guys, you know, unless, uh, unless the, 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 the performer uh, was broken down and had barely a tooth in his head, was playing, you know, not even that well, but had made records in the 20s, they, they were authentic. But Muddy Waters, you know, and uh, Howlin' Wolf and these guys in the cities making this loud music as they plug their things in, they were putting those people down. That's not folk music. Well, it was urban folk continuum. And uh, I remember B.B. Uh, King said, thank God for Charlie Kyle. And when Charlie did a lot of stuff, he moved to Buffalo. And he wrote my foreword. And we shared the same birthday, August 12th. Yep. He said we were star-crossed. Uh -huh. So every birthday, we started at my house, 
with martinis and beer. Yeah. And then we went to his house for the part two. It was like a caravan because he did a lot of playing and music. He nice. put together a group with hands-on stuff, and he he ran the uh, um, uh, American Studies program over at UB. And then we actually did the first transfer of us. I went to UB to teach those students uh, in his program, American Studies, about a, the history of what I do now. He came over to Albright Hall and he did the hands-on stuff for the kids, playing all these marimbas and stuff, yeah. and shakers, and, uh, and then you know when he left UB, he said, um, uh, he had a great, great point. He says, I'm tired of fighting the windmills of academia. Mm. And he retired to Connecticut. I shed many a tear when he left. Yeah. He was one important person. But that, that whole idea, of, you know, when the critics and uh, historians start really paying attention to this stuff, and they see, you know, the, and the better writers like Peter Gorelnik, how they use that imagery of, of the highways, you know, when I do my rock and roll class, that we do the lost highways. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Here's what these guys were traveling. Then you had the white guys, Merle Haggard, and these guys who went out to California, you know, first to pick grapes and uh, potatoes, and and then you had the black guys who were going to their various places. You know, first Chicago, uh, and then later California. You know, and then you had Charles Brown and Nat Cole. You could play piano and say. So, um, had those independent record companies. Oh my God, what a world! Yep. And I get to teach about it. Yeah. And I, and when I did my all my concerts that I did, this I did this with a couple of students. When Elvis Costello, Buffalo State loves jazz, all these things. Steve Rabofsky, and um, we were doing this stuff in '76, '77, '78, '79. And I always made sure we had workshops, you know, and then we brought in, you know. The critics, we brought in uh, uh, Stanley Crouch, I just got his new book, you know, the uh, Kansas City Lightning, study of Charlie Parker in Kansas City, uh, Gary Giddens, uh, Ira Gittler, Don DeMichael, I brought them all in. Nice. Yeah, it's 1978, and then it's 79, we did another thing, I brought other critics in, I brought Ben Sidron and the Heath Brothers, and I brought, next year I brought in Jackie. Jackie and Roy, and um, I forget who the other one was, uh, um, the electric guitar player. His wife wrote a book about him, uh, one of the first fusion players. Uh, I can't think of his name right now. Um, and then I started doing these other, these other projects, you mm -hmm. know. And, uh, and I always made sure those, the education was there. Who yeah. were writing the books and who had the magazines? Galen Garth. Uh, he, he got all of those old um, um, uh, cash box oh, magazines, nice. and he got the rights to them. So I have all those all those things that he left for me. Neat. It was really nice, terrific. You um, in your in your book, you have a lot of detailed charts about record sales and so forth. In your mind, um, can you pick out an artist that you think? whose record sales are justified, whose talent is justified by record sales. Who's, who's an artist that comes to mind? Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole. Right off the bat. Okay. You know, Alabama went out there, even whitened his face. <laughs> it was terrible. He's surprising. When he played in Alabama? At, no. When he we, went to, when, at one point before he got to California, it was so hard for a black man in the Deep South, as you can imagine, he had a whiten up, he thought. Oh, it's scary. Yeah. There's, a, there's a documentary that shows when he was doing it. But when he went out there, and, um, you know, Central Avenue, and um, he, all he did was those early records were just played jazz. And yeah. now Cab Calloway claims that he tried to convince Nat that uh, he had a little stutter and he was embarrassed to sing because he couldn't really. He says, You sit. You stand in front of a mirror, and you pronounce the words slowly, and you will be able to improve your diction. Well, I don't know if that's all he did, but I'll tell you, it wasn't the most articulated 
singers in the history of American pop music. You know, just on the way here today, the, uh, I don't know if it was a Buffalo station or a Toronto station, they played him singing Stardust. Oh. Good Lord. Was that amazing? <laughs> So I'm glad you picked him. You know, and what I didn't realize, that, you know, he, he, he wanted to live in Hollywood because he was out there, Capitol Records, yep. the house that Nat built, and he moved into this neighborhood. It was all whites. And so the people came to him and they said, listen, you know, we've got some problems here. You know, um, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. They didn't, they didn't come out and say, um, you know, that he was the problem. He knew what they were talking about. And Nat said, well, you know, my wife and I meant to talk to you people about this. You know, there's, some of the people are leaving their garbage out, and this is a really ritzy neighborhood. And so I, I hope we're going to put some of that garbage away because, uh, you know, we like it here, and we're not moving. <laughs> <laughs> he set him off at the pass. And I found out he made these <laughs> records of his hits in Japanese, in, in, in Spanish, in French, in Italian, he couldn't speak them. But he must have worked so hard on his diction uh -huh. that he could learn the words, not read the stuff. He learned the words, and, and then he would take trips to all these places. Oh. That's how rich he got. Wow. We didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything I about know. it. It was unbelievable. What a remarkable guy. What about the opposite? Is there someone that comes to mind that you think had minimal talent or individuality but managed to really be at the top of the record charts? Well, Paul Whiteman got a raw deal, I thought, you know, you know, the king of jazz. I thought they treated him, you know, a reverse discrimination because that's not answering question, but you know, they, they treated him poorly. Because he had great jazz players in his group, and you know he had two, two things to answer. You know, uh, and he, I always have my students take a look at Duke Ellington and and Paul Whiteman, and uh, one of the things that my book is trying to show is objectivity. You know, Whiteman didn't stretch to do what Ellington did, and Ellington didn't get quite the popularity that Paul Whiteman did, but the critics, especially the jazz people, took these rotten shots at him, white man as in white man robbing uh, the world of jazz. And you know, this idea that, w that blacks own jazz, nobody owns jazz. You know, mm -hmm. most of the players got from there. Because if you're going to say that, then, um, then these black men should not be able to play classical music. If you're going to use or that basketball, argument, huh? Or basketball. Sure. You know, I mean, yeah. that's pretty ridiculous, that's right. isn't it? Of course, and it's so, uh, it's, it's nasty thinking, number one, and it's limited thinking, number two. And uh, one of the things I've tried to show in our world is that, you know, I told the class, now we're going to go to country and folk. Now, for many of you, you're from the Northeast, and you're going to think this stuff is not so great. But I want to show you some really great artists. And uh, today, they are treated that way, but they weren't during the lifetime. And it, it took a while for some of the younger historians to come in, like the Greel Marcuses, like the Nick Toshes, uh, like the Peter Gorelnicks, to really show. Now, my mentor was doing it. That's why I'm lucky. So I came up with him, and I learned about it. I didn't really have an opinion. I just didn't listen to it. And once he got me there, and we talked about it all the time, I go, what a great man. What a, uh, a gentle spirit, mm. you know, to not be so ob obnoxious as this stuff sucks and this stuff is. So that's what that book tries to do. Yes, just it, show, it, it surely does. Just show the people and you don't have to like the stuff. And, and I tell the students, I said, you don't have to know all those charts. I didn't write a textbook. I wrote a, a source book. So it just shows you the enormity of this stuff. And yeah. I am, I'm always fascinated by how much was out there. And, and I'm fascinated by the... You had one chart that it was almost like a poster. And it said King Records. It was a thing for King Records. Oh, yeah. And it said, we sell in all three fields. Hillbilly, 
pops and sepia. That's right. That's and it, it's so Sidney informative thing. to see that yeah. that language. Yeah, because Cincinnati was was a, like a border town. They had they had the black part of town on one side, and they had the the, the white part. So they had Moon Mulligan and Hank Penny and his radio cowboys knocking this really. And then they had Winoni Harris or Wild and oh my God. And uh, here's a statement you had uh, regarding Benny Goodman, that Goodman was white and more palatable to the dominant white pop audience should be a little surprise. Even while making a radical shift, popular culture seizes upon that which is most accommodating and secure. Yeah. Well, I think that was part of the culture at the time, you know, that's all. But, you know, he brazenly went ahead and he brought in Teddy Wilson. Yeah. You know, it helped that John was pushing, Hammond was pushing him all the time. But he was a Jewish guy, so he understood a little better. I always felt that Sicilians kind of understood that stuff too, uh, because uh, we were swarthy and dark and curly-haired, my people. You know, we had been run over and run by all these other people, which I didn't know at the time. But when my mother uh, wouldn't allow us to speak Italian. She said, trust me, I know why I'm doing it. Because when she came up, uh, her father, they used to make fun. And he was from the northern part, uh, uh, Grandpa Girolamo. They would make fun of him. Oh, you know, where's your accordion? Where's your Neapolitan hat? Huh. You people smell funny. You got, uh, you know, you do all that. Oh yeah, it was not so nice. And Sicilians, it was worse. It was worse because uh, the Sicilians had an attitude, you know. They were run over by you know, having a, the, 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 the Swedish folks came down and ran the country. And Oh no, that's why they had godfathers. I mean, I don't approve any of that stuff, but it was... Uh, and then I got stories, you see, from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mancuso, he was one tough SOP. <laughs> I didn't like him at first, you know. But uh, he'd go to the ball games, and I'd have like maybe 33 points against, Ferd I'll never forget it, against Fredonia. And I had a cousin who was going to be playing in another year. He was a freshman. At 33 at home, and there was uh, nine minutes to go, and we were winning. He took me out. And, you know, I wanted my other yeah. sub pals to play. And my grandfather would sit behind the behind McAdam, the coach, and he'd get up. What are you doing taking the kid out? You don't want him to score too many points, huh? He's a Sicilian. You white son of a bitch. <laughs> I go, Grandpa, Grandpa, what are you doing? Calm down. <laughs> you could have had 45 points. He's my family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's tough. That's a good story. Yeah. Uh, tell me about some of your most memorable moments in the jazz clubs in Buffalo. I mean, is there someone that something, some night, some artist that stands out in your head? Oh my God. First time I went to the Bon Ton on Waverly Street, is on the east side. It's it just like a typical Buffalo, New York, or New Jersey bar, you know, corner. You walk in, there's a long bar, there's a back room where you might have fish fry, etc. Well, they had, uh, uh, put up a, a little stage this high so mm -hmm. they could get some, you know, outlets in. And um, uh, th I, this seems to be, I have, there's no ad for it. I somehow found out the three sounds, Gene Harris and Simpkins and Dowdy were playing. And uh, I was taking piano lessons at the time. And Tom Jones, he was a sixth man. He could always get free and I'd give him these blind passes. And he was taking piano lessons. You know. One of us loved Les McCann, and one of us loved Gene Harris. We're talking, who was the funkiest of them all? So we had these fights. So I said, well, let's go see my man Gene, because he's playing with the three sounds at this place. that We'll find it. We don't know where the hell it is. It's on East Ferry. How hard are they? We went there. Had the piano. They didn't even have that set up yet. That's how, This piano was right on the floor. And they came out, the three of them. And I look around, and it's 9.30. There's only like five people in the joint. Uh, I, I was to find out that the black audience comes out a little bit later than 9.30. So we're right next to him, and it was an old piano, and he was hitting the keys so hard 
that a couple of the, you know, was not a good piano, and these keys were like flying. Ivory was flying, not a not hundred of them, but, you know, five or six of them. I go, he's beating the piano fucking up, Tom. Look at that. <laughs> I know less is good, but look at this. And they just, I mean, I was just blown away. And it was, he was here, and we were here, I love him. Holy smokes. Nice. And then I got to, you know, I met him, you know, and I interviewed yeah. him a little bit. And then when he came in to the to the Royal Arms, which is a, you know, bigger club on um, uh, off of Main Street on West Utica, um, I think he, he wanted to work out, and uh, we had a, a trainer named Tony Sartori, who also loved jazz, and I called up Tony. I says, Tony, these guys, a lot of them come in and uh, from out of town, and they, I asked them if they're athletes or anything, and, and they didn't have health clubs in those days. You, know, you had to go to the YMCA, and if you weren't a member. You know. So he said, Charlie, you know I like the three sons. He said, bring him down. Nice. I'll get him in the gym, and we'll do some stuff. And Johnny Lytell was like that, too. He had been a Pittsburgh sort of a box or something. So I got Johnny Lytell in there, and there was a few others, too, just because of our connections above state, you know. Cool. Yeah, um, of course Coltrane was, you know, <laughs> Elvin Jones and McCoy and, you know, Jimmy Garrison and stuff. And I, I was just doing some interviews with my dear friend who I uh, spent a lot of time with. His name was Paul Gresham. He had a group called Birthright. And a little bit later in his group, um, uh, he had Ricky Ford. Ricky Ford? Joe okay. Ford? Joe Ford. Who's the one Ricky who Ricky Ford plays yeah. tenor. The one who went to McCoy, played with McCoy Tyner. I Joe was, Ford or Rick I think Ford. Ricky Ford. Okay. I'm not sure. Well, one, whoever it was. Okay. So it, Paul looked just just like McCoy Tyner. And as it turns out, when he got on the road a little bit, we started trading records as uh, kids just out of high school. I just happened to meet him, and uh, he was with his cousin and two other black kids who were cabbages. And uh, I, uh, we started, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You collect records? I go, oh, yeah, I got a lot of records. I had maybe 1,500 at the time, you know, in high school, just out of high school. And, um, and he played a little bit of piano, but saxophone. And so I remember the first time we met off on Delavan, on the east side of Delavan, in the black community. And we went to his cousin's house. And they told me to bring a couple records. We are going to trade. So... You know, you get a couple of records you've heard over and over again, and you see what, what he's got. So we hit it off real good, and he lived on Florida Street. So I would go to his house on Florida Street, and his mother was really fabulous. And then he'd come to my house, and uh, and he loved my mother. In fact, he had, he had her sauce, spaghetti sauce recipe, her, her coleslaw with the pineapple recipe, and a few others. And so we loved each other's mothers. So we were all the time. So he had got to meet McCoy in New York. So now this is the second time the Coltrane came in. So the first time, you know, I didn't talk to Coltrane. No one I mean, couldn't talk to Coltrane. He was very serious and went backstage. But this time he goes, Charles, you're going to love this. We're going to sit with Train in between every set, you and me. I told, he says, I told him I got the hippest white boy in America. <laughs> <laughs> he knows more about jazz history than I do. So there I was with Coltrane. Well, he was having the teeth problems. You know, well, I think it was sugar. He had a lot of sugar things. Uh, but we talked to McCoy. I was going, you know, is that an E minor vamp, you know? Because Paul had shown me how to do the, the, the little bit of the My Favorite Things, which I would play over and over. Not well at all. And, uh, and then Jimmy was nice to talk to. Elvin was just sort of aloof. But in between every set for six nights it was it was just remarkable. It was unbelievable. It was fabulous. And my non-interview with uh, Thelonious Monk, with a black kid who was a bad basketball player, uh, Jimmy um, something, and he happened to be a a, a, a worker at uh, the the Royal the, the Royal. Uh, the hotel that was right next to the Royal Arms. The Royal, it was called the Royal Arms, it was called the Stratford Arms. Oh. So when these guys opened this one time cleaner, cleaners, it was a big cleaners, 
as a jazz nightclub. Uh, they called it the Royal Arms, and they created a uh, a shield, you know, with two um, um, blades crossing, R on one side, and the other, the bottom was A, Royal Arms. And there was a stage that you walked up five steps to, and it was like semicircle, had a semicircle bar, and there was a space between the edge of that stage and where the uh, three um, uh, cash registers were, and that you could actually fall off that stage if you got too far to the stage. And then you walked up those five steps to get on the stage. And um, so Jimmy uh, said, Charlie, Charlie, I talked to Nellie, uh, you know, the wife of uh, Monk, and I told him, you know, that I got this white kid who really knows a lot about jazz, and uh, could he get an interview? And she says, well, you know, I think so. Maybe Friday night. Tell him to come before the 10 o'clock, the 9.30 show. So I came at 8 o'clock. And uh, so he was there. I said, you got to be there. I mean, you know, she, oh, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll take you up and I'll introduce you to Nellie. So he knocks on the door. And, Nellie, this is Chuck, you know, a basketball pal and jazz guy. Um, so is Monk ready to do a brief interview with Chuck? So I had a whole bunch of questions on this. And, and she goes, well, you know, I don't, I'm not so sure right now. <laughs> so she, she goes to ask Monk, you know, yeah, so as the young man is here, uh, uh, blah, 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 and he's on the bed. And uh, so she, she opens the door. And she goes, you know, Chuck, I don't think he's going to do an interview tonight. And so if she opened the door so I could see he's doing a simulated backstroke as if he's swimming. <laughs> like this. And he's not stopping. I guess that was a, a message that he's not going to get an interview. <laughs> so Jimmy looks at me I go, we tried. It's okay. I always have this story. Yes. <laughs> it makes for a good story. Yeah. And today's his birthday. Oh, really? Yes. Well, I'm so glad that, that his son, you know, picked up the yeah. mantle after yeah. trying the rhythm and blues world for a couple of years. Right. It's just like Natalie Cole. You want to do what your father did. Yeah. You know, and they both went Speaking back. Speaking of that, Ravi Coltrane came to Hamilton once. Yeah. And he looked so much like his father. I don't know. Kid. And I was sitting next to him, and it was a very weird feeling. Eerie, huh? Because wait, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to remind myself. This is the sun. Wow. Because he's sitting there with the tenor sax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're about to run out of tape here. Okay. But um, I wanted to, one more chart you had. Mainstream stars from 1900 to 1950 and underground stars. I did one of those? Oh yeah, you did. Under mainstream stars, we had, I counted this. Yeah. There was like 15 white people and almost all male. Right. And under Underground Star, there were 12 black people and five white people. Does that say something? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. What, uh, I don't know, who were they? Ruby Braff and... Uh, well, these were, no, big, big names. The big names. Okay. People who, who you would recognize. And um, I wasn't going to draw any conclusions from it. But it just seemed yeah. like... You know, if if a fellow like Stanley Crouch said that the white musicians have absconded with with most of our musical styles, yeah, does is he correct in that in your estimation? Oh, I don't know that. I mean, there's a sensitivity on his part. I mean, he's always been, you know, uh, contentious about uh, some of the whites. You know, and, and, you know, a lot of the people who owned the record companies were white, you know, and, yeah. and I think they felt more comfortable dealing with them. Some of them might have been prejudiced. I mean, I don't think that Norman Grants was, and I don't, I don't know about Gibson, you know, with uh, Concord. Um, his tend tend to be white, and you, may, you love Benny Carter and a couple of the others, but, uh, um, you know, it was a while ago when I did that, so yeah. I don't... Well, you didn't. You didn't say that, so I don't want yeah. to put that. Yeah, I, it wasn't done consciously. I don't know why I chose who I chose. I can't even remember what I did back then. 
on that. Do you so. find uh, that there's an interest, oh, how do I put this? I, I, I'm disappointed when I see hardly any black audience coming out to like blues events and jazz events, at least oh, yeah. in Utica, and it's like, where are they and why don't they have an interest in this music? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a lot of lack of education. I really do. I don't think they have enough, they haven't taken many courses in anything like this. Mm -hmm. And um, to, because I have black, black kids come and say, man, I never heard this kind of music, you yeah. know? Because they're in the rap and hip hop and it's, it's, yeah. it's a faster pace and it's, and they're not, history is a pain in the ass for most of these people. You know, they take my course because it says uh, pop or before it was jazz rock foundations. And they, there's a sense that these courses are, um, because it's not in their major, that it's, it's going to be a gimme course. The course should not be as hard as anything you take in your major. And this should be a fluff course. And then they get to me, and, <laughs> and if, you know, half the class is getting an E on, on all my first tests. And they're not that hard. You know, and I have the stuff on Angel. I have review quizzes for them. I have review uh, sample questions. All, many of them the same things that are on the test. And they just have terrible study habits. And I don't mean just the black kids, the white kids. Yeah. And the black kids just, you know, they, they never heard of who Louis Armstrong was. Unless, unless their parents were kind of hip and um, were big on education. You know, and then there were some really sharp black kids around, you know, and the, we're, we're very white in our department, you know, we're getting some black kids, but, right. um, you know, in the old days, I'll tell you something, uh, a couple of my friends, uh, um, Chuck Domenico and Larry Bynum, who was black, and this other guy, they used to go to New York City, and they would get us some of the cream of the crop kids. That's when Steve Robuski was here and his whole crew. I mean, they were the sharpest kids I ever had. And those guys, when they left Buffalo State, they stopped sending people out to New York City. And they find that they can make as much money from some of these kids who are deprived of whatever, and they get financial help to right. come to the college. And we're getting a lot of these kids. And it isn't all their fault. But so many of the white and so many of these kids coming to college don't belong in college, mm -hmm. you know? And there's a lot of support at Buffalo State. And uh, uh, this was a very black, um, uh, dominated administration at the high end when Muriel came in. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you had to be very careful what you said. I remember Don Metz, who runs the stuff over at Birchfield, He's an avant-garde player, fabulous, fabulous person, but probably the best friend I have here. That's why I do a lot of stuff with them. And uh, he was going to do, uh, 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 he always cooked a lot of food, great food. So there's a guy, Stanley Durrell, Buckwheat Sideco. So he had this thing, this menu, some of the administration was going to come to this, and it was called the Buckwheat Sideco um, menu. And all of a sudden, Without checking, the president and three or four of the people, one in diversity, uh, started making phone calls mm -hmm. and took him to task mm -hmm. for this racist thing he was doing. And uh, I, I said, pardon? I said, do you have any idea who Buckwheat Zydeco is? <laughs> Fuckers. You know? <laughs> so ready to jump. Right. You know? So it's well, a dangerous, it's a yeah. dangerous thing with jazz. Yes, you know? and academia too. And academia, and you have to be very careful. And, and I just try to say, let's stay objective. And, uh, right. you know. So, well, yeah, it's you been a must great pleasure. Oh. And uh, I'm, we're about to run out of speed here, so. Yeah. Well, I'm thanks. Thank You're you. kind. And, uh, <laughs> it was uh, very interesting for me. Oh, thanks. Glad we got to meet. Yeah. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, well, come on by again, and uh, we'll let you stay in the Mark Murphy room. Cool. You won't turn gay, believe me. All right. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. It's been great.